Hello and welcome to SME News and Views, brought to you by SME TV. I'm your host, Angela Vithulkas. This week our panel discusses whether the prison population will grow with business owners via wage theft, the continuing battle between online shopping versus shop fronts, and maternity leave. Who gets it? On Friend or Foe, we look at Australia's natural disasters and who's helping our SMEs, and we profile a family business, l and Smash Repairs. Welcome to our show. Let's kick it off with our panel. Kerry Chikorovsky, Director and Founder of Chikorovsky & Associates and former leader of the New South Wales Liberal Party. Welcome, Kerry. Thanks for having me, Ange. Andrew Morello, winner of the First Apprentice and Head of Business Development at The Entourage. Thanks for having me, Ange. Thank you very much. And Craig West, CEO and Founder of Succession Plus and Director of SME Association of Australia. Now, we're going to start with wage theft. How big a deal is it? There are more than 100 industry and occupation awards in Australia, 22 of which have changed as of March the 1st. With the likes of Columbaris, Coles, Bunnings, ABC, Qantas and even Combank coming forward to declare their wage underpayment, what chance do SMEs have of getting it right? Craig, how do you feel about prison terms, name and shame lists, shame notices, million dollar fines, all for these guilty businesses? I think you've answered the question, Ange, by giving the list. When you've got businesses like Commonwealth Bank that have got tens of thousands of employees, yeah. they can't get it right. How on earth is a small business owner with, mm. you know, mum and dad trying to run a business, look after the staff, pay the bass, lodge things on time, sort out the super? Yeah. How in hell can they get it right? Well, it's too complicated. Well, they've got HR and payroll yeah. departments to lean it's on. It's far too complicated. Software People don't understand thing. what they have to do. It's not because they're thieving money no. or they're trying to rip off their staff. That's a really short-term tactic. Yeah. It's because they don't understand what they have to do, and it's just too hard to get it right. It's been but, really negative, though. But that's just the point, what you've just said. It's not about people deliberately trying to do it. If people are deliberately ripping off their staff, then honestly, I have no Absolutely. sympathy. Sort of no man. sympathy for them sort whatsoever. Absolutely. But, you know, we know that particularly for small and medium-sized businesses, the paperwork is one thing. Trying to keep up with what's going on with awards and other things make it e equally difficult. So um, in the law, it's a long time since I was a lawyer, a very long time ago I was a lawyer, but clearly in the law, something that is criminal has to have intent behind it. So I kind of agree in a, a way with Christian Porter. He's saying that these bigger companies probably need to be held to a higher level, and I think that's probably right. They Correct. probably have a higher standard that they have to, have to be involved with. But for small businesses, I mean, honestly, a long time ago, I was Industrial Relations Minister, yeah. ancient yes. history, and we found that when people came to us saying they'd been underpaid, if we actually wrote to and spoke to the business owner, nine times out of ten they went, oh my God, I didn't know, yep. and they sorted it out. That's the approach we should be taking Andrew, for small business. unions yeah. are pushing for a five-year prison sentence mm. on anyone that's getting caught. Yeah. It's no wonder we're all scared. Look, I, I was lucky to be around um, in the real estate se sector during the reforms with regard to licensing and, um, you know, you know, uh, punishments to uh, people that were doing the wrong thing. And we, probably all it took was two or three people to actually be prisoned um, to get everyone on track. Um, I think there needs to be a collaboration between small business, big business, um, government, taxation departments... Um, and utilising technology and tools to try and make life easier. Well, there is an amnesty on at the moment for superannuation, so anyone that's yep. missed out or delayed in paying their super. Yes. I guess the general feeling is that SMEs, big or large businesses, is is stealing from their employees. And, and they are, in fact. If they haven't been paid their correct wages yeah. or they haven't been given yeah. the right superannuation, which has to be invested for the long term, yes. they, they are robbing, robbing them of benefits. But are they doing it intentionally? Do they deserve the million dollar fines? Do yeah. they deserve going to prison? I, I don't know, I find that a bit hard. You know, it, does the end justify that means? Well, I, I've got a, a slightly personal experience here with one of my very close friends. Um, he's got a bakery uh, up in Glenorie, and uh, he did get um, uh, scrutinised, and they did audit him, and he had a discrepancy of about $20,000 over a three-year period. Right. Um, and he was calling me at 11, 12 o'clock at night, feeling like an absolute criminal. Yep. Um, and the, the whole process that he went through uh, was not a very positive experience, even though he was happy to acknowledge that he had made the mistake. Stake. But it's come, become a PR, PR disaster yeah. Yeah. For, for big business, certainly. Yes. When you've got someone like Combank coming forward and saying, oh, sorry, yeah. you know, we seem to have underpaid people. I mean, they're the ones that are tracking 
you know, 30 cents on a transaction yes. and coming yeah. at you for your yeah. statement fees. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and chasing you for the money yeah. that and you think yeah. they So, look, I think there is... I think we need, do really need to distinguish between, you know, large corporations yes. and yeah. small businesses because, you know, we said earlier that large corporations have in place or should have in place all the appropriate tracking Absolutely. methods. Absolutely. So they should have a... They've got an HR department. They've got, a, you know, they've got yeah, IT payroll. specialists who can actually go through and work out yes. whether their yeah. payroll has actually been paid appropriately. Um, if they go through that process and they're still found to be wanting because they haven't actually bothered to go through that yep. process before, then I think there's something, you know, which, in, something in giving them a, certainly a significant financial now, some of these slap awards over the wrist. That they are changing. Even I, I read through the changes and and I was flipping from sentence to sentence and trying to work out it's what, ambiguous what and they it's, want it's them confusing. to do. Yeah. You've got to track the yeah. hourly workings of, of any uh, staff during the week or however you pay them and you have to line that up whether they've had their breaks even these are on salaried even yes. salaried mm. workers mm. you have to line up whether they've had enough breaks whether they've worked the weeks that or the hours that you said they were going to work in their contract if they've worked any more you need to settle that quickly this is now going to become a compliance nightmare you, you will crush entrepreneurialism yes. in australia no That's one will want reality. to employ staff you you won't you won't want to employ staff the reality is you're not going to want to grow your business no. um, and not with the... staff anyway you'll Correct. be contracting going overseas we yeah. won't be employing people here. We won't. Payroll tax will be the least of our worries. Yes. Compliance on, on normal will be, yeah. We, we'll, yeah. Payroll taxes will be one And for probably, Ange, the, the last thing I wanted to, to mention on that too, I, I, we had the chance to listen to a great interview yesterday um, about a website that a young uh, gentleman, I think, out of Western Australia has created. It's called outflanked.com.au. Yes. Um, and I think there's going to become more accountability from an individual's point of view. It's like when they get their credit card statement every month, if you ask 10 people, do you reconcile your credit card statement? Um, um, you know, 20% of them probably do. I've never done it, tell you the honest I want to say But yes. the company ones get done, but your personal, yes. you don't. No, and, you don't. And I've probably been, as someone who travels a lot for, for business, I've probably been charged for so many hotel things that I've never realised because when I have actually realised, they've double charged me three or four lots times. Lots of things, Andrew, that you'd rather not remember. Probably, correct. <laughs> That's why I don't look at those statements. I'm just going to jump I'm just gonna jump to the next one because we've got a lot to talk about. Online retail versus business shop fronts. With major retailers like David Jones aggressively closing stores as their profits plunge, and with e-commerce booming around the world, what exactly is the future of our bricks and mortar businesses? Australian online businesses are seeing over 15% growth in their revenue, and online shoppers are growing. In fact, eight out of 10 Australians shop online. Andrew. Yes. Is there a future for shop fronts? Yeah, Online, I, where's it all going? I think it's going to become a thing around being smart retail. So yeah. um, I was very, very um, lucky to be privy 15 years ago to the vision that um, Woolworths had for um, the service station sites. And uh, for those, once again, who, who do know my background, I've come, my family's been in the service station game. Um, for those who don't know, Woolworths undersells their fuel by two or three cents under cost price, what they're paying for And the it. shopper dockers. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, to, in mm. order to um, create one, number one, brand loyalty. Number two, the only thing you can't buy online is fuel. So the whole idea of it is that they're going to start to, to reduce their retail space, and you've seen it now with Woolworth Metros, and it's, that's, that's and they're calling it smart retail. The smaller footprint. The smaller footprint, and you'll be picking up your um, your you know shops shopping from a refrigerated box at your um, local service station. Um, and the other big thing that we're seeing now with with this retail. Um, hard spaces. Look, you've got Bunnings are now about to open up. I've been privy once again. I've been working with the company. They're opening up a thing called the Kitchen Collective. They're actually going back to retail, but they're making it more um, specific to a particular product yep. um, and rather than it being just a general come in, see if there's something that, that tickles but, your fancy. But, and I'll, I'll say it again, but... Mm. Kerry, 30% of online fashion sites are actually seeing a little bit of a decline. Mm. Um, so sites like Boohoo, Pretty Little Thing, etc. people are only shopping on there when the specials are coming mm -hmm. up. Yeah. So that's, that's a shift. Yep. That's a shift. There's hope for small business shop front still, but it's, it's not all online. No, well, I think, I mean, and I have to put my hand up here, I shop a lot online, mainly for me it's a convenience thing. I can actually sit there on a Sunday night, you know, when I'm watching maths, and then <laughs> and, and actually go and do my shopping online. You know, look at and look at yep. some of those uh, the retail the specials. Shops. They come up once yeah. you've searched once, it stays on your phone. They do, and they keep on <laughs> popping up. So I do actually do a lot of online shopping. Um, having said that, there is something about the experience of going in and actually trying clothes on, which is actually I think you know something Nothing. I don't think we're ever I don't think we're ever going to get rid of that. But I do think that what people are doing 
doing is they're going online, they're looking at what they like, and then perhaps going into the shop and trying it on. They're doing price so comparisons, they're they shopping are. around. Absolutely. Yep. And, you know, you, you, and you can actually see that um, you can, sometimes you can get the same thing elsewhere. Yep, cheaper. Um, but yeah. go in, try, which is probably not going to be good for the retail, go in and try it on there and then you order it online. That's yeah. not good. Well, but, which but is, I do think which that's is why the shop fronts need to pick up their game and have yeah. that solid online presence. They do. But the big brands like David Jones, they've really dropped the ball. They left it too, to too late. That's they what they did. did. I don't think they honestly believed, believed they it was going to lose happen. traction mm, mm, mm. in well, their shop fronts. A bit late now. Bit late. Bit late. It was, it was the, the old closing shop. It was the old Kodak. Kodak story, you know, they, you know, they, they thought the digital cameras were going to be a phase. Yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of people in, in uh -oh. the fashion retail Oops. probably thought that fashion retail was going to be uh, online well, fashion retail. Thirty was billion was spent last year. It's on a, on track and trajectory, uh, predicting thirty five billion next year online. But it's the third party payment systems that are also finding this lucrative market mm -hmm. yeah. and clipping the ticket. Yes. So that, that's one interesting formula. And then you've already got uh, people considering what do SMEs do better in real life than the online world, when it's actually, in fact, the smaller online retailers that are killing it, yep. Yep. as opposed to the big online retailers because they still don't get the customer service. Factor. I think small business owners need to be a bit smarter. Yep. Instead of whinging about the fact that Amazon's here, yep. you know, I've got a client that sells nearly a million dollars a month through Amazon. Wow. Mm. He hasn't got an online store, yep. hasn't got a website, it's just Amazon, but his product is sold through Amazon and he sells a million dollars a month. Correct. Well, He's hugely competitive. Everything like that will be available via Amazon. He's got a better margin. Yep. Amazon handles all the logistics, yep. all the delivery, all the payment. He doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't just worry about anything. Just brings the product in. He's making more money than he ever did. So and I'm now saying to him, sounds good, right? I'm now yeah. saying to him, close the shop. Yep. What do you want a body shop yeah. for? All you have yep. to do is look after people, pay wages, well, worry in... about wage theft. Why would you have one? Yeah. <laughs> Get rid of it. You're in partnership with a landlord if you do have bricks and mortar. Absolutely. Because those overheads are just getting ridiculous. If, if you can even afford, unless you're in a, a third or fourth category type of premises, then you don't have the foot traffic. So it is getting ridiculous. But it's interesting how they're seeing that massive competitive fierceness online as well. Yes. There was only a few online. So now there's so many online. Well, I think the fact that um, I live in the city, I work in the city, I walk down Pitt Street Mall, and since the beginning of the year, I have not seen a fashion shop which hasn't been on sale. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, and like it's, six and months it's, of the year. And it's not just... Constant. It's, yeah. yeah, it's not just like the, the three weeks after you know, Christmas or after New Year. It's just it's constantly. Yeah. They're the only always question is on which sale. sale is it? That's right. Yeah, that's yeah, the it. Boxing the, day but sale they're always the on sale. sale. Is it the 60% off? Yeah. Further prices discounted. reduced. Yeah. That's very dangerous yeah. for small business because to try and compete with that... Yeah. Well, we're we're expecting it now, right? We're expecting everything to be cheap Well, I mean, my children laugh because I say I never pay... Um, full retail price for anything. I'll wait till it goes on sale. Yeah. It used to be only in America. Now it's come here. All right, moving on. Maternity leave. Women are a key part of the Australian workforce, both as employees and business owners. Each year we celebrate International Women's Day in March and we highlight the achievements of women around the world. Now, Kerry, even though 35% of all businesses are owned by women, we still haven't got it right for SMEs mm. in terms of women ownership with maternity leave. Mm. Has the government dropped the ball on this? Look, I think it's a really difficult thing to expect governments... And I'm not just asking Kerry... Because I'm a woman. No. That's right. And it's a long time since I've had a baby, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, I think it's... You know, as I said, I think it's hard to ask governments to pick up all the bills um, in terms of business and including um, maternity leave because yep. I think there's some pretty generous maternity leave provisions now available to women. But I do understand how difficult it is for women, particularly those who are business owners, to close their, you know, to sh you know, yep. shut their businesses down while they're on maternity leave. One of the reasons, though, that women used to say to me that they actually were leaving organisations and setting up their own businesses was because it gave them that flexibility. Yep. They could actually be at home with a baby, baby asleep in there. They're doing, they're basically running their business from the kitchen. So, I think it's a difficult one. But the Ange issues with paid parental leave yeah. as a SME. Um, as a self-employed female or woman, yep. the government paid parental leave is, is, is very low. If you are earning less than 150 k a year as an owner, you can have 18 weeks of paid parental leave, which is about $650 a week after tax, and you have to take it in a block of 12, yep. Yep. and they've changed the rules now, you can take a block of six weeks later on. But the problem is, as an owner, and we all know, having been self-employed, you can't always pick the time you want to take that downtime. Mm. So, so what would you do? Can I, would you well, want? Would I, you want is, to? I this mean, this is a difficult. This is a difficult thing. You would hope that if you are self-employed, that you have a structure where you can take a step back. But parental leave. I mean, you don't know if you're going to feel like wanting to come back to work in six weeks, or mm. twelve weeks, or a year. 
as an employer, you have more flexibility because you can take longer and the employer has to give you a job back. But, I mean, for small businesses, that's also an issue. Because, an I issue. mean, you know, the, the uncertainty of, you know, Is when and if back? Yeah. you're coming yeah. back yeah. makes it difficult for small businesses. At least, again, go back to larger corporations. They've got more people. They can put people in. They can have people acting up in positions yep. or Correct. whatever they can cover them. But if you're a small business owner and, and you're... You've got you know, three staff and somebody leaves. And you go, it's, it does when are they... Big gap. You can't replace them. It's a 33.3% yeah. gap. That's, that's, well, you'll be paying double. Mm. Because, exactly yeah. right. The staff. So... Yeah. Yeah. Look, and I'm all for, I was one of the people who came out and supported um, you know, maternity leave a long, long, long time ago because I do think it's important. I think it's important that we recognise yep. that families are the basis of our community yep. and we need to support families. We need to support women in particular, but, you know, um, paternity leave for men is also something which I think we should be talking about. And it's, it's important because the paid, paid parental leave is available for men and women. Absolutely. Yep. So, mm -hmm. I think, so I think that we should be think, you know, thinking about how mm -hmm. we support families, but we need to do it in a practical way, which doesn't mean that small businesses end up going to the wall. Well, Kerry, I think it, what, what we're going to see is, once again, it's got the same elements as what I spoke about before. There's, there's going to be a, a bit of a, a rejuvenation in the sense that, you know, I grew up in the Costello days where he was saying, have one each <laughs> and one for the country, right? And I, would, I always thought that was the greatest how thing. How many did your parents have? Three, three. They, they, for the country. Costello's they followed rules. Costello's rules. Craig, what about you? Did they follow? No, two. Yeah. Only two. Yeah, we, we, we stuck with two. I wish, two. I wish we, we had one. six. I've only, I've only had two. Okay, <laughs> so my parents were the only ones who did, did Costello's, um, Costello's ideas. But, you know, the, the idea of, uh, that I'm starting to see is two things. One is innovation with allowing um, women to get back to work from home. Yep. Yep. So we're Makes seeing now with position. things like Slack and most um, you know CRMs and client relationship management tools and, yeah, and project management tools. That's if they've got the job that allows them to do I agree, that. I agree. But in, in that case, that there is certainly opportunities there. If there's not, then there's not. But also what we're seeing now is it's actually forcing, to some respects, uh, an element of a pressure cooker situation where um, you've got these women innovating. Yep. And through our entrepreneurial um, work that we do with the entourage, we're seeing, you know, there's a particular mother right now that we're working with down in Melbourne. She started um, children's products online. Yep. And uh, in a three-year period, she's gotten it to $2.5 million in revenue. Now, she would never have started that business if she hadn't become a mother. So she would have stayed in, in her corporate Innovation role. out of necessity. Correct. Last the problem comments, is, Craig? I think the big problem here is, and it's pretty typical in my view, government is not looking at reality. Yep. Mm. This is legislation that's designed for the 1960s. Yep. People don't work five days a week, 40 hours, for 12 weeks in a row to have maternity leave. What they want to do is come into work every morning for three mornings in a week yep. and then go home and look after the children, which suits hubby or, or the other way around Pick them up, because he's them working off. late or yep. she's working yep. early. There's just no flexibility in it. It's, and it's, I'm afraid it's typical of government legislation. They're just not looking at the real situation. The gig economy has been here for nearly 10 years. Yep. They're not aware of it yet. They need to get their <laughs> so, head in the game. Uh, so, I so think that's a little harsh. But we've just, we've but discussed all the problems. We haven't quite found all the solutions. We <laughs> might save that for next time. Yep. Thank you to our panel. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but um, we look forward to seeing them, of course, in the future. Thank you to everyone, Craig West, Kerry Chikorovsky and Andrew Morello. Coming up next, we profile a family business, three generations and still going strong. Not all smash repairers are the same. Or are they? Joining us today in studio are Gary and Daniel Ma from l and Smash Repairs, going strong since 1969. They are the second and third generation of the business with Gary's dad and Daniel's grandfather being the first. I spent some time at their workshop recently to see how the family business runs and invited them to come into studio and share their business smarts. Thanks for coming in, Gary and Daniel. Gary and Daniel, just to be clear. So as a protege, was he worthy of coming in and taking over or have you not quite let him go? Oh no, he's got full control. It's been a, a, a long journey and a hard journey sometimes. And not everyone can do it. And I know there's a lot of families that in our business that haven't got along with each other. Traditionally, family businesses are tough. I come from a family business. And our industry has its, has its struggles. You know, it, it is tough. You know, there are some hard decisions that you've got to make. Um, but it's the, the proof that we're still here is, shows our resilience and that we do work well together and, and we're going to continue to do it. I spent some time at the workshop. You weren't there that day. You, you missed out on seeing some of my skills in the smash repair industry. But what really struck me as being amazing about the business was the staff. And I know you guys spent a lot of time on training staff, particularly apprentices. How has that changed, Gary, in when you had the business early on, getting apprentices into the trouble in the pipeline that Dan faces now? 
earlier on, there was a lot more access to young people and apprentices. Today, we have far fewer people coming through. And I, and I know there's a lot of reasons for that. But once you establish a rapport with the, with the young people, whether it's the young boys or the young girls, we want to get them in, up and running because it is a family. The whole business is, is a family group. There's a shortage on tradies. You're, you're facing that real mm -hmm. issue of being able to keep the business going if you can't get people that are trained to do something that robots can't do. Well, we're in the middle of a skill shortage of not only trades people, but yeah, apprentices as well. I think the amount of apprentices now that are entering the in our, our industry is, is a fraction of what it used to be you know, 20, 30 years ago. Absolutely. And yeah. what's it going to do in the next 10 years? You know, will, we have anyone, will we have anyone coming into the trade? We see the TAFEs are shutting down in Sydney alone. I think there's been three TAFEs shut down in the last three years, and there's only one left, I think. Where, where, where are they going to get their training? Where are they going to come from? It's, it's, it's so not a it's very... A, it's a huge challenge that's not in your control in, in the business. But, you know, we've spoken before, Dan, about compliance and red tape. Gary, did you have as much compliance and red tape? I mean, I know Dan spends a good part of his week just making sure that all the books are done. It was just easier. It was a lot friendlier. Today we find no one seems to be as happy. Right. Business is not as happy as we used to be. But today, everyone's straight down the line. They just want to get it in, get it done, and they're under so much pressure themselves. It's not as enjoyable. Thank you very much for coming in. To see and hear more of l and Smash Repairs, check out the video on our website. The link is on the screen. Each week in our friend or foe segment, we look at who's been a friend to SMEs and who has not. This week it looks like a close tie between Mother Nature and the government. Australia has been hit hard in the last year with natural disasters, ranging from the drought, which has been ongoing for the last three years, fires, floods, and now the coronavirus. We know that this combination has government and the financial markets worried, and clearly something needs to be done, but what? SMEs, their families, their communities, they've all been devastated by parallel and simultaneous natural disasters that could see the extinction of many, including and especially our regional SMEs. Joining me today for our friend or foe segment is Kerry Chikorovsky, director and founder of Chikorovsky & Associates and former leader of the New South Wales Liberal Party. Thanks for joining us, Kerry. Pleasure. This is a hard subject. Um, friend or foe has been set up specifically to discuss who's getting it right and who's getting it wrong. And to all the SME community, or most of it, it looks like government's really dropped the ball. Well, I think the foe in this circumstances is really the four things you mentioned. The combination of drought, fire, flood, and now coronavirus. There, that's a combination that no one would have anticipated. So I think that's what's really hitting the small business community. The response from government, I think, has been pretty good. I don't think it's been outstanding, but I think it's been pretty good. And I think the government is focused on trying to get the help to the people in the regions in particular who need it most. I mean, for example, in relation to the coronavirus, they're looking at what they can do for tourism, far north Queensland, regional New South Wales, regional Victoria, to try and support those businesses through what is clearly a very, very severe impact. But what we've got on the one hand is the impact that has happened. Mm -hmm. Whether you're talking about droughts or fire or flood or now the coronavirus, there's an impact that has happened. Government is notoriously slow for reacting and they can no longer afford to do that. In particular, if we take the most recent, which is the coronavirus and how it's been hit in the tourist areas, it's not going to take long for those businesses to feel the impact immediately of that massive, almost guillotine type strike that's affected them with business just stopping, it's just dried up. Which is why you'll see, or you've been seeing from all the states, for example, the campaigns holiday at home, encouraging Australians to stay in the country and take their normal annual holidays somewhere that they haven't been at home before. Probably not a hard ask at the moment because a lot of people don't want to take their That's normal right. holidays it, to Asia. To Asia, so you know, they will stay home. Do you think this will bring us closer together in terms of... of taking away the, the bureaucratic appearance of government and really seeing them as, as being in a leadership role. I, I don't think so. I don't feel like that. But 
you might be the advocate on the <laughs> other way? Well, I actually think governments have str have shown quite strong leadership across the board with all the, um, the dramas we've had. I know that there are people who, for example, in drought affected areas who feel the government should have put more money in, and I absolutely agree. Decades ago. Well, and we'll, I agree we'll that... Let's highlight know, that again, decades yeah, ago. And look, I agree. I mean, I've had a conversation with you previously about the fact that we should have had dams starting to be built in the late 90s, but because of the political situation at the time, we couldn't get it done. I would suggest now that those discussions which are also taking place again, they will come to fruition and we'll start to see at least not doubt, we can't drought proof, but we can actually make sure that we have a better ability to cope with drought if we put some dams in. But I also think, for example, in relation to things like the fire and the flood, getting infrastructure paid for by government, built by local, uh, in local communities, by local tradies, yep. that will start to help It'll those It'll keep economies. the money in the local economy. Absolutely. And, and they need that. But they need a lot of common sense. Yep. Um, that seems to be sorely lacking, but that's traditionally correct in government. <laughs> um, well, that's, that's usually the view of bureaucrats it, it, and yes, politicians, it, yes. It is, but what we've got now is, is the word resilience being thrown around a mm -hmm. lot. And do we have a resilience strategy? And that's been a, a, a big word in corporate. It has been talked about at local levels. Mm. It's now being talked about at state and federal levels. But is resilience just a new keyword, or do you think they'll pull their finger out in government and actually have a resilient strategy that will save the country as opposed to taking two or three years to decide what it is. I think one of the, again, more interesting responses to these dramas has been the fact that state, local and federal governments have been working together. Now, does that mean that they'll have a formalised resilience strategy in the future? I'm not sure, but what it does mean is that they're all understanding now that the only way that you overcome the terrible circumstances that a lot of your SMEs are finding themselves yep. in and those communities That's are right. finding themselves in is to work together. And I'm, I'm encouraged by the, um, the interaction of those three levels of government. I'm still getting uh, feedback every day of what people are enduring during mm -hmm. this, this terrible time that's being hit. And there are people who are suffering with mental health because they've been physically and emotionally devastated, mm -hmm. and yet they're still expected to fill out you know, 35 or 40 pages of an application to get some financial relief. Seriously, when is government going to realise that their number one factor can't be who's going to rort the system, it has to be who do they need to help for the system. Someone is always going to rort every single mm. system. But you can't expect people who've lost everything to fill out 40 or 50 pages of an application. Well, I'd like to you, you to give me those examples to take to the Prime Minister because I know personally that the Prime Minister has said he wants to get money into those communities as quickly as possible. Uh, my understanding is that he told his fellow Cabinet members exactly that. So if that's happening, then I well, think it needs to be... We've gone online to, well, and we've downloaded those applications. Well, can you actually send them to me and I'll make sure they get to the Prime Absolutely. Minister's office? And, and but this I is do what think, friend or foe is all about. Yeah, and I, but I do think we need to be conscious of the fact that there does need to be a process We've seen on previous occasions where governments have provided stimulus to the economy and, dare I mention the word, pink bats. Yep, and they got it really wrong. They got it wrong. So we, we have to make sure that we get it right, that the people who are needing the assistance are getting it, but complicating it too much to make it you know, too hard for them to get that assistance, that's not what the Prime so Minister got, wants. So we've got two extremes. We've got a pink bat scenario that happened a long time ago that was rolled out irresponsibly yep. and to a devastating effect in itself. And now we've got government bureaucracy that's worried about getting it right yep. to the point where they're, all a bit paranoid. they're getting it wrong. But do you think SMEs have suddenly become less robust and not able to withstand bad times? Or do you think it's just extraordinary times? I think it's an extraordinary combination of events. And I do think that particularly in the regions who rely on you know, tourism traffic, who rely on you know, exporting their product, or their produce. They can't export because they're not producing em enough. They can't get people into their towns. You know, the, the guy who has the best bakery, get, you know, sells the best pies yep. in Australia, no one's going to visit him because no. of all the terrible things we've seen. And you know, the, the combination of the fires on television overseas, and they were front page on every they, newspaper and they were. lead and items that's on every TV. People coming here. Discouraged people coming. And now we've got the coronavirus. Because so everybody is... overseas thought the entire Australia Oh yeah, absolutely. I was overseas and people said, oh, were you safe? I said, I live on the 20th floor in the middle of the city. I think I was OK. But, I mean, there is all that, all that combined. And I don't think it means that they're less resilient. They're just having a lot more to cope with. All right, so you're telling us that government is getting it right and they're trying hard to do it better. I'm telling you that governments are listening and are trying to do the best they can, but they do have some constraints, and those constraints are that they have to get it 
to the right people in the right way. Well, we know these communities have been devastated and very badly affected, quite traumatically. And we know that if you are feeling overwhelmed or stressed and you need to speak with someone, please know that there is help. You can go to lifeline.org.au or you can call 13114. Thank you very much for joining us, Kerry. I hope we get you back on friend or foe so we can find out exactly who is friend or foe. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thanks. Welcome to You Asked For It. Everywhere I've been in the last few weeks, hundreds of small business owners seem to have one big thing in common. How do I not stuff up my payroll? Government is threatening a crackdown. Laws look like being tightened and penalties raised. SMEs are scared. If the big end of town can be out so badly for so long, for so much, what chance do SMEs have in following a complex and often extremely difficult award wage system that seems to require a degree in astrophysics to apply. Compliance and red tape have always figured high on the SME challenge list. So the best approach is to get it right from the start. If you're not using payroll software, then start. Get an expert like an accountant, bookkeeper or HR consultant to set you up and if you have a much more complex structure, then get more help. Make sure you know which award system your staff or your business or industry belongs to. The buck stops with you as the owner or director. If the large corporates who have an entire HR and payroll department to lean on can make mistakes, then obviously it's complicated. The questions and effort you put in at the beginning will save you a lot of heartache and financial upheaval much later. Do your homework sign up for payroll updates and take responsibility for the financial well-being of your employees. They rely on you. Just saying it's too hard won't be an excuse. Hope that answers you asked for it and for any other questions you'd like SME News and Views to include in this segment, you can reach out to us via smea.org.au and we've got some tips and links for payroll there as well. That's it for News and Views this week. Thank you for watching. A very special mention to our show sponsor, SME Association, for making this possible and believing in the journey of the SME. For more on any of our topics, some behind the scenes videos and pictures, please go to smea.org.au and you'll find us on all the socials. I'm Angela Vithoulkis, giving SMEs a voice.